Welcome to the program, The Uganda We Want. My name is Robert Mulanzi, and um, today we are privileged uh, to have one of the administrators, educator, and uh, an evangelist in this country. He's a senior citizen whom we are going to have a discussion, a dialogue about the Uganda we want. And if we are to establish this country, we've got to look into the following key mountains of this country one the mountain of family the mountain of religion the mountain of education media entertainment business and of course government and so in the program the uganda we want we move out we look out for you uh, who is uh, you know has experience when it comes to the to the mountains that I've talked about, and you share to us what you think, what you want. In the program, the Uganda we want, we look out for key influencers of this nation who have experience in education, in entertainment, in business, uh, to mention but a few, uh, and they share with us the Uganda they want, the Uganda they envision, the Uganda they want to see. That's why we have this program on Dream TV. And of course, before I introduce uh, the guest we have today, I just want to say thank you for all of you who go out on our social media platforms and you like, you comment, you share. Um, you know, we are very grateful because you've made this program what it is because you share, you comment, and you look out for us on social media platforms. And of course, if you're there and you want to be part of this, Please just go in, on your account, whether on Instagram or Facebook account or Twitter or YouTube, and just type in the Uganda we want. Uh, today in the program, the Uganda we want, we bring to you Dr. John Musisi Senyonyi. is a mathematician, academician, uh, evangelist, an administrator in Uganda. He was an immediate a vice chancellor of Uganda Christian University, a private institution in this country. He was appointed in that position in 2010. And of course, after a few years, he resigned and handed over to Aaron Moshengeji in August 2020. He was born in Nakasongola in 1956 uh, to Eliakim Kaja, a school teacher and Mrs. Kaja, a full-time housewife. He's one of the 13 siblings, and one of his brothers, the late Peter Nyombi, Uganda's former Antony Geno, and former member of parliament for Blue County in Nakasongola district. We are going to hear from Reverend Dr. Canon Senyonyi about the Uganda he envisions. Uh, join me, and we welcome uh, Reverend Dr. John Senyonyi, uh, to speak to us on the Uganda he envisions. Doctor, I'm happy to have you on the show mm -hmm. on Dream TV and on this particular program, the mm -hmm. Uganda we want. Could you please greet our viewers? Uh, thank you very much, and I want to greet you viewers. It's a joy for me uh, to be able to address a topic that I think each one of us should be participating in. And so thank you for the opportunity. Well, mm. you're welcome, uh, Doctor. As mm. a mathematician, an evangelist, mm. an <laughs> academic administrator, <laughs> which Uganda do you envision? I think the biggest problem that personally I see in this country is the problem of moral decadence. Mm. It does not matter what we do, whether it's work, it's education, um, you know, civil service, politics, name it. When there is moral decadence, everything goes the wrong way. Because the problem that I have personally observed 
is that many people then are more concerned about what they can get out of Uganda um, rather than what they can give, like pre the, the late uh, President Kennedy said. Mm. So I think it is essential for us to address that particular ailment of our society. Asking that key question, what mm. have I done for Uganda? <clears throat> Not mm -hmm. what Uganda has done for me. Precisely. Precisely. Um, because if you are morally balanced, if you are morally the right side up, if I may put it that way, uh, then you look at another person and you are considering what you can give that person rather than, rather than what you've taken out. Mm. That was my philosophy when I was still, before I retired, in all my work. The issue of what I was, going, I was going to get out, as far as I was concerned, was ne not necessary. It was mute. Because if I did the right thing, if I served other people, if I cared about other people, if I cared about those things that would develop them um, to be the kind of Ugandans or even Africans, because in my last job I was dealing with the whole of Africa. Mm. But if I was dealing with all those things... And I knew that, for example, the education I was giving them was an education that would enable them to look at other people differently, to look at work differently, to look at um, family differently, um, to look at anything wherever they are, look at it differently mm. from what the world actually offers. It would make all the difference. Um, so that has been my passion, really that especially as a Christian, as a believer, and I've been working with the Christ now for almost 46 years, wow. uh, since I gave my life to Christ, that my concern is to see that this Christ, first of all, who transformed me, is transforming the mindsets, the worldviews out there, and people uh, looking at all things very differently. Mm. You know, there's a statement that is attributed to C.S. Lewis. Um, to be honest, it's, a dip, it's disputed if he's the one who made it. But nevertheless, it's a very good one. It says that <clears throat> education, good as it is, if you give it to, uh, a, to the devil, he simply becomes a cleverer devil. Hmm. And that's the point. That's the point. You can get all the education you want. And I've interacted with academics for many years because I started working in university in 1978. And uh, my understanding with many of the academics, they could have all the brains you can think of, but when they lack in morality, mm. when their moral fiber has been eroded, everything goes the wrong way. So the more decadence in our country, should mm. we attribute it to our education system? I did tell, you know, during my last years, I was chairing the vice chancellors in Uganda, mm. both public and private. And one of the things I kept on mentioning to them is that the word university has the same root as the word universal. Mm. In other words, when you're giving an education, that education should encapsulate everything that the person is. So you're talking about the person's intellect. That's where mostly they, they major. You're talking about the person's social life, mm. the person's psychological setup, the physical, but also the spiritual, because the spiritual governs everything. Mm. And I kept on telling people, the problem with our university education, whereas universities actually began as Christian institutions, where Christianity infused everything that um, the student would be learning, we, we, we now, we, what we did was to grow an education that is mainly intellectual, and has neglected everything else. Mm. 
the worst of all, it has neglected the spiritual. Because without the fear of God, hmm. what are you going to get? No wisdom, no knowledge, no yeah. understanding. And I did not mind what the, who the vice chancellors were. Mm. I made it clear to them, you cannot have a university education that neglects any aspect of um, the student's life. Mm. In fact, uh, my last station of work was Uganda Christian University. We coined in 2012, uh, during my vice chancellorship, we coined, call it a tagline or whatever it is, but which runs that we were giving a complete education for a complete person. And that, for, that forced us to consciously think through mm. what kind of education we were giving. Mm. That we want to touch the student's life in every aspect of their life. So that when they go out to work, when they go out into politics, when they go out into marriages, uh, family life, and so forth, they are, they, they've been transformed, not simply in the head, but in every aspect of their life. Because what happens if your social life is completely deficient? Mm -hmm. And you're married, you really do not know how to relate with your wife or your husband. You become a very clever devil indeed, as that, <laughs> as that quotation you're says. You're intellectually upright. Yes. But when it comes to other areas, you're not. <clears throat> yeah, you're knowledgeable, but in as much as <clears throat> you have that knowledge, um, the knowledge with moral bankruptcy makes sure that the knowledge is misused. Hmm. <laughs> And that's what is happening. Can you actually. say that again, Doctor? Knowledge with a moral bankruptcy assures that knowledge is misused. Hmm. This is exactly what has happened. I mean, I do remember years ago, uh, President Museveni, and I can't remember which year because, I mean, he's been president for more than 30 years. <laughs> um, you say things and sometimes you forget yeah, when you say But I it. do remember one time he made a statement which I think hmm. we should have understood very clearly. Hmm. And he was talking about the thievery that is in government, hmm. which unfortunately has gotten worse. And he was talking about the accountants. He, he, he played with the term or with the title chief accountant. And he said chief accountants had become thief accountants. accountants. Hmm. This is what happens when morality is lacking. Because you look at the public resources and you think that they belong to you, or you mix them up. We know very well that uh, there are people, especially in the civil service, but even in the private sector, by the way, uh, who create trips so that they can get per diem. <laughs> mm. You know, that kind of thing. Simply create trips. Um, so there is no concern for morality, or should I even put it better, there is no fear of God. Mm. There is no fear of God. Because where there is no fear of God, there is no fear of evil. You will do whatever you want. Mm. <laughs> because God is not part of what you're doing. He's not part of it. Mm. Um, I, I, I learned that very early in my walk with Christ, that one of the most critical things is to have the fear of God. Of God. Because what the fear of God does for you uh, especially for me as a Christian, I do read the Bible, I memorize the many verses and all that. The point is, I know what is right before God. Mm. So it's no longer what is right among the people out there. It is more what is right before God. Mm. So whether then I'm in the public or I'm in the private, I will be a, I will be consciously aware <laughs> that th God is here with me. I think that brings in the example of, of Joseph. I know you're mm -hmm. familiar with, with yeah. the Bible. You yeah, know? yeah, he was left in charge of the household, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but, but 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 he says something that you know. Whenever I read yeah. that story, yeah. <laughs> it touches yeah. me, yeah, and yeah. he says, "Well, I cannot sin. I can't mm -hmm. do this mm -hmm. to sin against God. Against God, precisely." Uh, precisely. <laughs> you see, um, what eventually happens when there is moral bankruptcy mm. is that people can do things that are unconscionable, if I can put it that way, uh, 
simply because they know nobody's watching. Mm. But if I have fear for God, then I know I'm always under his watch. If I'm in right? any position of leadership. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I, exactly. I, I, don't, I don't look up to my boss. I yeah, know there yeah, is yeah. Uh, uh, someone who is bigger than my boss who is watching exactly. what I'm doing. Mm. Exactly. Uh, and I remember one time, by that time, I was a deputy vice chancellor and I had uh, uh, someone that I respected who was the vice chancellor then that became a great friend. Mm. And uh, one time I was speaking in public and I said, I do not work to please him. Hmm. I work to please God. What was the reaction? That could he be... accepted it because he's a Christian. <laughs> he's a Christian and he knew it. Okay. And I went on to elaborate that, um, you see, if I'm serving God, hmm. he will be happy. The vice chancellor himself will be happy. Because he knows he does not have to keep on checking on his back, watching his back hmm. for backstabbing. Hmm. He knows very well that wherever I am, I'm not going to start doing strange things. So to me, that is a very, very critical issue. The issue of morality, separated from education, or even worse, there is a morality that is defined by the law. Mm. That is worse. The one that is defined by the law, by, by the law. of the country. Mm. That is in the constitution. Let, let me tell you why. Mm. You see, if you define morality by the law, you are essentially defining it by democracy. Mm. They're talking of freedom. So if we agree that something is okay to do, <laughs> we go ahead. Do we it. do it. <laughs> and, the, and the examples abound right now. I mean, when you talk about the Western world, which has been swept yeah. by homosexuality, has been swept by transgenderism and all sorts of weird distortions of morality, what has happened? They've gone into the law. So the law now has become the definer of morality. Mm. Another example, which is even here. I mean, increasingly right now, many young people who are marrying, they are ending up divorcing. Because the law allows it. Mm. You can divorce. Yes. But what does God say? Mm. What does he say? Especially in Malachi chapter 2. I hate divorce. He used, uh, the Bible uses the word hate. Yeah. He says he hates divorce. So if I fear my God, then I will fear to go into divorce. I will do, and, and it's not fearing simply to separate with someone who is impossible and so forth, but is that I will do my level best to preserve my marriage. Mm. I will invest everything. I mean, isn't it interesting that we, uh, many, many people are very good investors uh, in financial matters, but they are extremely poor investors <laughs> when it comes to family. <laughs> and spiritual matters in that, in that yeah, case. <laughs> yeah, uh, so they, they really just don't know what to do. Mm. And this is what I'm saying. So going back to education, that's why I say our education has got to change. Hmm. Our education has to change. Our education must be an education that is complete, that is total, that brings together both the intellectual and the other aspects, dominantly spiritual, the other aspects of a person's life. Yeah, it has got to bring all of them. Hmm. And in, in line with what you're saying, mm. uh, just a question comes to my mind. How best can our education system mm. um, help us to achieve that, to have both, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to have a complete person, a complete human being? A complete being, education a, of a complete person. A, a, a complete person. How can we achieve that? Now, I don't know that I can completely explicate. I wrote a paper on it. 
mm -hmm. uh, which is a long paper. But all the same, I can say a few things about it. Mm -hmm. Let me first of all go back to my childhood. All church schools started their school every weekday with the prayers. Mm. We knew you had to be there at the parade. And if you arrived late, you were subject to discipline. <laughs> You're talking of a very simple thing. Yes, school. yes, yes. <laughs> that is 1968 by then. Uh, well, then. it's way back. I started in 1961. <laughs> okay? Mm. So we always started with prayers. Singing a hymn, prayers. It's not like every teacher knew or was committed mm. to that faith, to the level that I would have wanted. But be that as it may, there was a conscious effort to ensure that Christianity is brought in. Because this is a church school. It's a church school. And so that to me is something that has been largely lost. Uh, I know there are schools that still do it. But I also know there are, there are many schools, church schools even, that don't do it. And that's very sad. But to me, that's just a small bit. And I, I bring that as an example to show mm. that at that time, the church was fearless mm. to bring Christianity before the students, irrespective of who you were. This is a church school. So... One of the things particularly for, uh, for me that I was involved with uh, when I was at Uganda Christian University was very simply to ensure that the curricula hmm. reflect the Christian faith. The curricula. What is being taught? Yes, the curricula. Hmm. And so I, I was very keen on that because I realized the importance of it. And that actually meant, of course, we had courses that were called foundational courses. Um, those foundational courses included all the Old Testament, the New Testament, Christian worldview, Christian ethics. Engaging the students, let them think through what is right and what is wrong and mm. who defines right and wrong. That there is a transcendent law mm. that defines it. So what we did, now some of the programs like the Faculty of Law, I remember, uh, instead of taking these courses as separate, and even some others actually, um, instead of taking these courses as separate courses, they started now working on their syllabi such that everything is blended in what they're teaching. Mm. And that is possible. And I don't know why we fear it. But the truth of the matter is, when you're teaching truth, when you're teaching truth, there is no need to fear. If you know that what you're giving out is truth. Is truth. There is a little book that I read long ago by a former Secretary General. I think it was Doug Hammarskjöld, uh, former Secretary General of what was then called the United Nations Organization, you know. And this little book, the title stuck with me because the title says it all. Hmm. It says, all truth is God's truth. Wherever you find it, <laughs> it doesn't matter where. That was a topic. It can be in medicine. <laughs> it can be in law. If there is something in law that says whatever it says, the truth has to triumph. All truth is, is God's, God, truth. God's truth. Simple whether it is in the social sciences. And, uh, and by the way, I should say that the area as a mathematician or mathematical statistician, I should say, uh, the area for me that I find cannot escape the truth of God is the sciences. Mm. The, re the, the reason is simple. When you look at the sciences, what is true is true. Let me just take a simple one. The I other mean, way around. <laughs> not the higher mathematics that I was dealing with. But let me take a very simple example that everybody can relate with. Mm. Two plus two is always four. 
you can't say 2 plus 2 is 6. Yeah. Now, five. for us mathematicians, we go further and we say that is best time. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the same with one plus one. Is, yeah, it's, it's always two. It's always two, but they say it is, could be three. So what I'm four. saying, uh, and um, science mm. to me uh, is, most in, is most inexcusable mm. if they fail to capture the truth. It's very, very easy because science exposes you to the mysteries of God like no other subject. Hmm. You can see the complexity. And when you see the complexity, whether it's an animal, it's a human being, the human being is particularly fascinating. Or you are talking about the, uh, the fabric of mathematics, or you are talking about physics or chemistry, hmm. whatever it is, you immediately realize that as a scientist, you either have to admit the sovereignty of God, the created order, of things hmm. in the world or you've got to hide yourself in the sand but everything is there hmm. <laughs> and uh, and by the way for me that struck me particularly i was doing my phd and i was working on a problem um that in fact appeared to be like it was going nowhere you could say maybe intractable but as I worked on it, the thing that struck me is the amazing logic. The amazing logic that was like the that was foundation of everything I was doing. Hmm. That what was right was right. What was true was true. What was wrong was, was wrong. wrong. Hmm. What was false was false. I could not take what is false and make it, you know. In other subjects, particularly the humanities, you can start arguing, especially if you're not very well informed. Okay? That's why they ask questions like discuss. Yeah. You begin to discuss. So you can talk of behavioral sciences <laughs> and you start saying maybe the person is acting like this because of this and so forth. Which you can't find in sciences. But the sciences, mm. straightforward. Very recently, I was reading... Um, a book. I'm, re I'm still reading it. I'm reading a book by James Dobson mm. on raising boys. And he was talking about what the psychiatrists had discovered mm. in the makeup, the brain makeup of the boys as compared to the brain makeup of the girls. The girls. Mm. Male and female. They yeah, are going to, com yeah. to compare. And is there. You can't run away from it. You can't say boy is a girl or a girl is a boy. <laughs> right? Mm. Like some of our friends are doing. It's absolutely clear that anyone trying to conceal truth in sciences can only do so only for a short while. Mm. Eventually they will be caught. And they can't run away from it. So this is, why, this is why I say that when you come to the sciences, you can never run away from truth. The truth is there. And the truth forces you to ask yourself some very, very fundamental questions. Where is this all from? Mm. Of course, then, I mean, when you talk about morality, uh, morality has got both a scientific side to it, but probably a lot more on the behavioral side. But whether you like it or not, it's there for us. And we should embrace it. And you, you, just, you just have to embrace the truth. Mm. To be honest, for me, I have found the truth of the Bible, the most defensible truth of all. Because the others, I can still continue debating. I can say in mathematics, maybe it is this, maybe it is that. Yeah. But eventually, of course, you are able to, 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 to come to an agreement. But when it comes to the truth of the Bible, it is true always. Always. Not just <laughs> once. 
No. <laughs> so, yeah, doctor, in line with that and mm-hmm. looking at the Uganda we want, how mm-hmm. best can we really have people like you, a mm-hmm. nation like you that embrace mm-hmm. this Bible, yeah. that speaks the truth always because we are looking at, you know, having or envisioning a Uganda that is God-fearing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, I have often said is another mistake because I talked about the universality of education, but the other thing that for me I think has um, gone wrong, mm. I don't even know how what to call it, but maybe I can say it is the suspension of the family from education. So... Oh. Particularly the parents. Mm. Now, I'm not blaming government as much as I'm blaming the parents. Okay? Because I think many parents don't realize that their role, when they take the child to school, their role does not stop at that point. Mm. If anything, it is enhanced. So, if we want a Uganda whose moral fabric is solid, first and foremost, it has got to start with the family. Because where do children begin? It begins from the family. It's from the family. Mm. So it has got to begin from the family. The first knowledge, my first knowledge of what is right or what is true um, came from the family, came from my parents. It did not come from anywhere else. Now, the reason I say that there is this suspension is because many, many parents, they have become too busy, particularly in the urban areas. They have become too busy Mm. for the principal role of parenting. And that's a mistake. They've got a lot to do. (laughs) So the children are growing like wild plants, like weeds, if you wish. The children are harvesting values from everywhere and anywhere. Mm. I would say, for me as a parent, when my children were young, giving them to the teacher did not mean I trusted the teacher's morality. No. The morality was mine. Hmm because of my fear for God. I wanted to instill the fear of God in their lives. Mm. Now, when a parent forgets that responsibility, that obligation that has been given to the parent by God, and you can now see how the fear of God comes down. So when a parent forgets that, then you end up with a child who does not even have foundational morality. So that's where it has to start. From the family. From the family. And I should say that uh, when we say from the family, that's a big subject. Mm. The church has got a very big role. In fact, bigger than the schools. In helping the family? Or yes, okay. in helping the family so that they can take their responsibility. Mm. If the churches are not paying sufficient attention to issues of marriage, to issues of parenting, to issues of family life, then there is a problem. Because we need to equip people. As a minister of the church, I have refused, in some cases, people who come to me, say, for marriage, and they give me one or two months notice Hmm. i say what am i going to do with you in just one or two months because for me before you enter your marriage Hmm. i need to prepare you for what you're going into because all of that needs to be looked at i need to be able to prepare them so that they understand what is marriage all about then there are aspects of course of parenting that are very important Now, so anyway, the family, for me, is where it begins. 
Well, you've heard it from Reverend Dr. John Senyonyi. We can't go beyond from this point. We've got to keep it right here. We will have him in our part two. Just stay tuned. This is the Uganda we want. My name is Robert Mulanzi.